a lot of things here to unpack about molybdenum. Now let's talk a little bit next about foods. So there's a lot of different foods that contain molybdenum. As I mentioned earlier, um, there really isn't, there's only one case report in the medical literature on molybdenum deficiency. And this was a case where there was a hospitalized patient was on IV nutrition or really rather um, parenteral nutrition, meaning they were being fed with an IV bag in the hospital and the, the parenteral nutrition didn't have any molybdenum. And so in that particular case, that's, that's in part how we know about a lot of those symptoms beyond the fact of the, the actual genetic disorders around molybdenum. But um, it's a very rare to actually develop a deficiency because molybdenum is so readily and widely available in foods. Now, as I mentioned earlier, just because it's not common to develop a deficiency doesn't mean you can't be doing things that tax your body's need for molybdenum to work. In essence, if you are eating a diet high in sulfites and metabosulfites as preservative agents, you're going to need more molybdenum, possibly more than what your diet might provide. So under these separate or certain types of conditions, you, gotta, you also have to keep that in mind. So generally the diet will provide what you need if you're eating whole real foods and taking good care of yourself. But if you're eating a bunch of processed garbage with sulfites in it, that's where you might start running into trouble. As well, we mentioned there's air pollution that can contain uh, sulfur dioxide, which can also put people in trouble or at greater risk for molybdenum deficiency. But number one food um, for molybdenum is peanuts. Now, I know there's a lot out there about don't eat peanuts, don't eat peanut butter because of the mold or the mycotoxins. And, and you know, there is truth to that. There are mycotoxins um, in peanut butter, and you do want to want to be cautious of that, especially if you've ever had a background of of being in mold or being exposed to mold toxins, particularly. Um, and mold-free diets generally tend to be peanut-free diets as well. But nonetheless, peanuts do contain high amounts of molybdenum. Now, so do black-eyed peas, and these are generally very well tolerated by most people. And then all these other things here also contain adequate quantities of molybdenum, and you can consume them in the diet. So not hard to get molybdenum through eating food. As far as molybdenum toxicity is concerned, not a ton of that either. So not a ton of toxicity that's ever been reported. There's one case report in the medical literature that was published in 1999 of an acute human molybdenum toxicity, and it happened or it, or it occurred as a result of supplementation. So this individual was supplementing over an 18-day period was taking a molybdenum supplement and over the course of that 18 days ingested about 13 and a half milligrams of molybdenum and then developed acute psychosis with visual and auditory hallucinations, a series of petite mal seizures and a life-threatening grand mal attack. The symptoms remitted several hours after the start of chelation therapy and in that in this case they used something called EDTA which is a which is a, a synthetic amino acid that can bind metals in the body and pull them out and help excrete them out. So only one case report ever really of molybdenum toxicity. It's not common. It's, it's rather well believed that molybdenum is tolerable at, um, at relatively higher doses than the RDA. The RDA is about 45 micrograms per day. Um, but there are a lot of supplements that you can buy um, over the counter, whether it be a multivitamin or whether it just be a pure molybdenum supplement that range anywhere from 100 to, you know, to 500 micrograms, you know, per capsule. And as a general rule of thumb, if we suspect or we see somebody, and I and I see in my practice, so although molybdenum deficiency in the medical literature is not really well reported on. I see this on a regular frequent basis in my practice where we measure molybdenum on a regular basis. I believe one of the reasons why molybdenum is an underreported deficiency is because doctors don't measure it. And what you don't measure, you don't find. And so um, we measure it on a regular basis and seed deficiency on a regular basis associated with a number of the symptoms that we discussed earlier. And where we generally try to start people is right here, 500 micrograms per day 
to, to, to help with recovering or with replenishing their molybdenum status. So if you're looking at supplementation, it's pretty safe to take between one and 500 micrograms a day. Um, keeping in mind, again, everybody's unique and everybody's different. There's always the possible potential that you could have problems, but if you start experiencing neurological symptoms, uh, visual or auditory, symptoms, especially um, like hallucinogenic symptoms, and you're on molybdenum, that should be your cue in to discontinue. Um, do it smartly. If you're going to supplement, do it smartly. Monitor how you feel. Pay attention to how you feel. And typically, it's always best if you're doing something like this to do it under the, um, under the supervision of a qualified doctor who understands nutrition uh, pretty well. Most molybdenum supplementation is going to be in this, the form of some type of chelate um, we say amino acid or Krebs chelate. Uh, so, for example, molybdenum glycinate is an, is, a, is an example of a commonly and widely available type of molybdenum. So when you're looking at the back of the bottle and you see the term molybdenum glycinate, that's just molybdenum attached to a glycinate molecule. The glycinate molecule helps you uh, absorb that molybdenum, molybdenum into your cells. Now, from an absorption perspective, molybdenum is very well absorbed from the diet. It's speculated that, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 80 to 90 percent of molybdenum that you consume orally is readily absorbed into your bloodstream. And that the bulk of that is excreted, you know, travels from your blood and goes to your cells, etc. But then it's excreted out of your kidneys. The, mul the, the bulk of that is excreted out of the kidneys. So um, a relatively safe supplement to take. If you've ever had sulfite problems or you suspect you have sulfite problems, molybdenum may be one of the things you want to consider using. Um, not that I'm going to encourage any of you to continue to eat a bunch of foods or processed items with preservatives like sulfates in them, but um, if you have a sulfite sensitivity, it's more sometimes more than just the foods. It can be the pollution in the air. It could also be, you know, any kind of medication that you might be on. Um, check your medication on the inactive ingredient list to determine whether or not it has sulfites in it. And if you're reacting to that medication um, and you suspect that it's because you're sulfite sensitive, have that conversation with your doctor. Consider the use of molybdenum. Also consider changing out that medication altogether for something that doesn't have the preservative, or even better yet, ask your doctor why you even need to be on a medication um, when there's so much that you can do in your diet and lifestyle to improve your health beyond the need for that medication. So that's a breakdown on molybdenum. Thanks so much for tuning in to Dr. Osborne's Zone. If you found this information helpful, leave me a message below. If you've supplemented with molybdenum and found it very helpful for you in your endeavors, Leave, uh, leave a little message below and uh, encourage others who may be looking at this as a potential answer to support their health. Thanks again and have a fantastic day.